Welcome to the Pemsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden, and this is our Thanksgiving special. Uh, well, it's obviously going to be a difficult holiday for everyone. Uh, the first and let's hope the last in a pandemic. Uh, most people who would have traveled to be with family won't be traveling, and those expecting to host friends and family won't be doing so, I guess, except over Zoom. That might come as a relief to some of you, especially after this contentious political se season. I mean, you won't necessarily find yourself sitting next to that Trump voting uncle or as it may be the super annoying woke cousin. Are these side dishes vegan? Um, still, to help you get through it, I've brought together two truly remarkable figures for a conversation about many of the themes that will be on our minds on this holiday. How do we heal the divisions amongst ourselves and our families and friends and also as a country? And can we forgive each other? The first is Peggy Noonan. Um, you know her, of course, as the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Wall Street Journal. She's the author of 10 books, but most famously, she was the chief speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. And I think of Peggy as the moral conscience of the Republican Party. Uh, her writings throughout the decades have always cut through the political rhetoric or partisan games of any given moment to remind us of the values we share, as opposed to the ones that divide us. Um, and while not a Trump supporter, her critiques over the past four years, I think, have always been thoughtful and empathetic towards those who find him so compelling. And Peggy herself has close friends and relatives who are Trump supporters, which she'll tell us about, and also how she personally has navigated not just her personal, but her political relationships over this time. My other guest in this conversation is Leon Wieseltier. He's the editor of the new quarterly journal Liberties, which is about culture and politics. He's also just a profound and original thinker, and it's truly an honor to have him join us. Those who have followed Leon's career will know him as the longtime and truly legendary literary editor of the New Republic magazine. They will also recognize him as one of the very earliest media figures to lose his career over Me Too, which I think has resulted in him being something of a lay expert in the topic of forgiveness. Very briefly, about three years ago, Leon was about to start work on a new journal funded by Lorene Jobs, the widow of Steve Jobs, when complaints about his treatment of some of the female staff at the New Republic was brought to light. Leon was accused of making uncomfortable personal remarks about some of the women's appearances and attempting to kiss a colleague at a party. And while not dismissing the seriousness of these complaints, it should be stressed that they were never near the level of a Harvey Weinstein or a Matt Lauer. Um, in fact, many female colleagues stepped forward at the time to defend him as a mentor and as an inspirational editor. But regardless, the complaints led to Leon's complete cancellation. Uh, he lost his new journal. He was fired from the Atlantic, where he was a contributor. And he's basically spent the past three years in the cancellation wilderness. Um, he's apologized and expressed remorse for his actions. And now, with the birth of his new journal, he offers some interesting reflections on his experience in an essay called Steading. Uh, but Leon also writes that we have become, quote, an unforgiving society, a society of furies, a society in search of guilt and shame. So we will definitely be speaking to him about all that. Before we get to that conversation, I just wanted to do a little podcast housekeeping before the holiday. I am, you know, proudly an at-home podcaster and uh, wanted to give you a heads up that uh, next week we'll be off. We'll take a little short break for Thanksgiving. And then before we have our Christmas break, we're going to be bringing on Charles Moore, uh, who is the official biographer of Margaret Thatcher. He's the new chairman of the BBC. And am I potentially asking him on to discuss the new season of The Crown? Maybe. Um, Charles has, will be able to 
tell us for those who are watching this new season. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy over the portrayal of Margaret Thatcher and, and Charles, of course, will be able to tell us whether it's accurate, whether it's um, a fair depiction of her relationship with the queen. He also knows other royal figures uh, quite intimately. So he'll be able to also tell us if the depictions of Charles and Diana and their marriage is, is accurate. Um, Charles is an old and dear friend. If I'm, if we're lucky, I'll be able to coax him into doing some of his imitations of the Royals. He's a absolutely brilliant mimic. Um, I can't promise that. Of course, it will give me the opportunity to use my British voice, which longtime listeners of this podcast have frequently complained about. Um, after Charles, uh, a big surprise. Well, okay, it's not a surprise now if I tell you, but Christina, my beloved ex co explainer, is going to join me in an episode about this controversial statue in Central Park of Susan B. Anthony that some are suggesting should be taken down and also in general about this movement to cancel suffragettes because they were, I guess, privileged white women. So that will be an interesting um, general conversation about statues, historical memory. And then uh, after that, we're going to have our special holiday edition let's just call it a party with uh, my current co-splainers, um, Megan Cox Gurdon, Caitlin Flanagan, Irshan Manji. Uh, so, so I'm looking forward to that. Then we'll take a Christmas break and then be back in the, in the new year. Uh, I wanted to also, since this is the season of giving uh, to remind you for those who are not subscribing uh, to the podcast that we really appreciate all your contributions. And if you join now before this weekend, this weekend after Thanksgiving, you will be able to join our monthly cocktail party. We're holding it the Sunday after Thanksgiving over Zoom. It's a members only party. And our guest of honor, and we always have a guest of honor, uh, this time will be Dr. Deborah So, who was on our podcast recently talking about the brain science and gender, author of a new book, uh, The End of Gender. So she will be on hand um, to answer questions. And also we mingle. Can I just say our subscribers are awesome people. It's, of course, BYOB. So join now. And if a little is a dollar a month. We'd appreciate maybe a little more, $5 or even $10 a month. Uh, that will get you um, not only an invitation to our exclusive monthly parties, but it will also get you uh, a free episode, a bonus episode that we do only for subscribers in which you get to join the conversation, ask our guests questions, and our newsletter. And at certain levels, you'll be able to get this podcast ad free and earlier than others. So go to patreon.com slash femsplainer. Uh, please, if you pay for other content, think about paying for this content that you consume. We're very grateful. It keeps the podcast going. Uh, and we're thankful to all of those uh, who support us. Now, just before we get to our amazing conversation with Peggy and Leon. We have a short word from one of our new sponsors. And when you hear it, I think you'll understand why I'm especially excited about this sponsor. So stay well, uh, have a wonderful holiday, have a safe holiday. And uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's have this conversation. We could all use a little extra wine this holiday slash pandemic season. And why not drink one that embraces the spirit of the holidays and is also delicious? One Hope is a Napa Valley winery built on hope and rooted in purpose. Every bottle of their award-winning wine supports a meaningful cause. One Hope's commitment to high quality wine is as important as its commitment to the causes they support. And through the sale of every bottle, One Hope has donated over 5 million to causes around the world. Whether it's building a school in Guatemala or funding over 3 million meals for children in need, 
One Hope is on a mission to nourish the future. One Hope believes that you shouldn't have to sacrifice your wallet to enjoy quality award-winning wines. And that's why One Hope's world-class Vintner collection begins at $25, so everyone can afford to have the best of Napa Valley delivered to their homes. So stock up for the holidays with up to 35% off wine from One Hope. You'll get 10% off four packs, 20% off six packs, and 35% off 12 packs during their biggest sale of the year. Every bottle supports a meaningful cause with over $5 million donated to date. So visit onehopewine.com slash femsplainers and use code femsplainers for $10 off your first order. These offers are available from November 24th to November 30th. So these are Black Friday specials. And they also, and this is the part I love, they have gorgeous best-selling glitter bottles and shimmering bottles for the holiday. So even if you're not getting out to those parties, you can bring a little bit of the party spirit into your own home. Visit onehopewine.com slash femsplainers and use code femsplainers for $10 off your first order. Cheers. Peggy, Leon, welcome to the Femsplainers. Thank you. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to have both of you on. I've wanted you on for such a long time. Um, Leah, if you remember even a year or two ago, I tried to get mm -hmm. you on. But so mm -hmm. this is, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be in both of your company. And I don't think there could be a better topic for both of you, you, you big thinkers. Um, Peggy, um, you wrote right after 9-11, or actually a year, almost to the year anniversary, you wrote something about the mood of the country after 9-11. And I'm just gonna read it to you. you. You wrote, I feel more certain than ever that for whatever reason or reasons, we, those of us who live now in America in 2002, have been put here to get our country through the big terrible thing and the things that will follow. That is our job. I have a purpose and you do. It is get through, hold fast, move forward, hold together, make the future, and do it with brio, with heart. And then you just went on to say, I think we all somehow know this without any of us saying it, uh, which is why since September 11th, so many of us are more generous with those we know and don't know, more delicate, more patient, more polite. We are better to each other. And we've been reminded that life is precious and full of beauty. We are more hungry for it than ever. And so hurtle toward it and through it with more courage and love. Well, we're going through something terrible right now in the country, which is a pandemic. We've been through political turmoil, and I don't feel that we're coming out the other side of it with the kind of generosity and gentleness. In fact, it feels the very opposite. Um, and I wanted your thoughts on that, both of your thoughts on that. Uh -huh. well, I'll jump in with, with um, something uh, personal. I was talking last night with friends with whom I normally spend Thanksgiving. Their family, my family, our kids grew up together. It's normally a lovely Thanksgiving in a house in Manhattan uh, with about 20 people. And I knew I loved it, but this year we are not doing it. There are children and grandchildren and, and concerns about health. And, and it's all become a little bit complicated. So we're all sort of staying on our own with our own little pod. And a friend was pouring out her disappointment last night. And I said, you know, I gotta tell you, the biggest thing is that I have such an appreciation that I didn't know I had for my previous life of bubbly affection. <laughs> you know what I mean? So moments like this, I think a pandemic and great mm. stress um, can make you think back a little bit longingly on how it was a year ago, but also make you feel with an extra tang or sense of excitement 
uh, about what you will be feeling next year. So it's a long way of saying, I don't know. I am, I can't remember all of the things 9-11 reminded me of, but this pandemic and staying home has reminded me of how much I enjoyed my life and didn't always notice it. I think um, the historical fact, when one considers the timing of the pandemic, you know, viruses are always very cunning. And uh, the historical fact is that the pandemic struck a society in the throes of ugliness. Uh, we were we were at some sort of moral, social, emotional nadir when the panda when COVID hit. Uh, one of the conclusions that I drew from my recent adventure is that the only thing I can no longer forgive is unforgivingness. Uh, we have become a genuinely unforgiving society with people on both sides demanding biographical and ideological purity and rummaging through everybody's past for things they said or things they did or things they might have done or things they might have said. And nobody is any longer regarded in our society as a fragile, flawed, vulnerable, uh, finite individual. Uh, everybody is regarded as either the perfect representative of an idea or a group or some sort of human failure that deserves to be cast out. And this is a terrible, terrible, terrible development. And it's not only about Me Too. It has to do with Trump. It has to do with populism. I mean, what is populism, after all, if not mass emotionalism? Uh, and... I am deeply worried for our society. I'm not so worried about what they call polarization. I think our system was created for conflict. And Madison, the wisdom of Madison was that he understood that conflict is a permanent feature of human affairs and it cannot be eliminated. It can only be managed. You know, we have no fantasy of perfect consensus or unanimity in our tradition. We, we believe in compromise and the management of disagreement. But I am worried about this unforgivingness. I'm deeply worried about it. Uh, and I see it everywhere. And it leads, of course, to a kind of sanctimony in politics and in public affairs and even in personal relations, I have to say. And uh, it's something we should, I mean, forgiveness and unforgivingness should be uh, really at the very top of our list of, um, of anxieties as a nation. Well, that's a great point. And this is what we're going to see also very personally over whether there are Zoom Thanksgiving tables or whenever we are next together, where you have had relatives who you have, the, the support for Trump in families um, seems to be unlike any other political disagreement in mm -hmm. recent memory. I mean, it does get very personal. Peggy, you have had your own personal issues with the Republican Party over these past few years. Um, you, uh, I mean, uh, to think that you, Peggy, who, can we just say was pretty much the voice of Ronald Reagan, <laughs> um, would have would feel alienated from your party is distressing and yet you retain uh you've written about having trump friends how do you speak to them how do you how do we plan to go at least mend these political differences between us that are um as leon says so unforgiving and and um and and seem at this moment fairly insurmountable you know the the word that leon uses <clears throat> i beg your pardon Leon, you are saying un unforgiving, and I think of it as ungenerous. Mm -hmm. um, I right, on, uncharitable, right. Yeah, I go on Twitter most days once a day. I really try to, and I just check in on what's happening and what's trending and all that stuff. The number of things people will say to each other, the ungenerous judgments, the snottiness, the snideness, the you are thrown outness. 
the you are not one of us. It, it is actually amazing to me that people will speak that way in public. You'd think it, they'd almost keep it to themselves. So I see us as maybe concurrently with the rise of social media in the past 25 years, or maybe that's not it. But what I see more and more in our society is the pointed finger, you know? Mm -hmm. One of the most um, compelling young people in politics right now is AOC. And AOC is all about the pointed finger, mm -hmm. uh, pointing the finger at people who are guilty of A policy, B policy, C policy. Um, and I just find it remarkable since, of course, politics is supposed to be a game of addition, not a game of subtraction, and ought to be marked by a hand put forward, not a finger put forward. So mm -hmm. I consider that just something amazing that is happening in our society, and we've all experienced it um, in terms of social media. In a personal sphere, I think it is so important to remember this. What you are politically, the views you hold, in most cases, that is a sliver of who you are as an individual. Your politics are not your essence of who you are as an individual. Um, and you just have to keep that in mind about yourself I mean, stay stable. Don't give yourself over to politics. That's giving yourself over to a false god. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, don't do that. Don't make politics a, um, a, a replacement for religious faith. Don't make it your big hobby that comes to consume you. Also respect others and realize politics is not or should not be their their the primary fact uh, of who they are. I come from a family where it's e been easy for me to think like this. Irish Catholic, Brooklyn, then Long Island, all Democrats. Just, you know, the Irish came to America, they looked around, they said, what party are we? And they said, well, we're Democrats. It just made sense. They fit right in. They were part of making FDR. Then they were part of making Reagan. Uh, so they've been an interesting people. I grew conservative politically as I grew older, but members of my family went this way and that way and this way. Well, I can't judge them by politics. That's just too stupid and too small. When I was, when I worked for Ronald Reagan, one of my closest friends was essentially a communist. He was a great guy. Um, a very good man, a very generous spirit. He would have done anything for me. Um, I had known him for years, a truthful person, a kind-hearted person, but essentially a commie in his politics, which he would tell you about if you asked. But if you didn't ask, it just didn't come up every second. And my views didn't come up every second. Then again, if we got on politics, we'd honestly share how we felt about politics. We did not have to forgive each other. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like we just knew differences is baked in the cake. Mm -hmm. I would say two things in response to Go Peggy. Ahead. The first thing I think is she's absolutely right. Peggy, you're absolutely right. American life and the American soul is wildly over politicized and it has been over politicized for a very long time and the irony here is that both liberalism and conservatism taught as one of their primary lessons the limits of politics each in its own way and that is a lesson that has been completely forgotten because both of them have been overwhelmed by a kind of ideological politics and ideological politics as we know from history is totalistic. It's all or nothing at all. And so politics now penetrates more deeply into the American psyche than it ever should or probably ever has. I, you know, I ran into a therapist friend of mine a couple of years ago, and I said to him, okay, just without without divulging anything, how many of your patients come in and talk about Trump? He said, most of them. <laughs> I said, uh, putting aside the political validity of such anxiety, that's crazy. He said, yes. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to say is that we know from this history of ideological politics 100 years ago, we know all the legendary stories of the time when families and friendships were broken up over communism and Stalinism and uh, you know fascism. Uh, we know that 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 ideology was a great disruptor and destroyer of human relations. When we look back on these stories now to us, they look tragic. They don't look yeah. justified. They look tragic, which they were. And so I think what I would say is that the most revolutionary act that anyone can perform in America today is to befriend someone who disagrees with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do believe that that unless you know people who disagree with you, you're trapped in this conformity and it impoverishes your imagination, which means it impoverishes your gift of empathy. It is very hard to be to offer empathy to people whom one cannot imagine because one regards their political difference as absolute. And so, you know, people have simply, this is going to sound odd, they've got to get out more. I don't know they can't <laughs> during COVID. Well, but, but spiritually, I, intellectually, Yes, that you have to have friends unlike yourself. That sounds obvious, but starting with multiculturalism 25, 30 years ago, there is this assumption we've been working with, which is that like should stick with like, and that unlike is in some way not just different, but dangerous. And, the, and you see this on the Hill, right? I mean, when is the last time that Republicans and Democrats ever shared a joke uh, or, or, or a beer? It doesn't happen. <laughs> Jokes it are doesn't dangerous, happen. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, I don't mean. Okay, so it shared. A, I don't know what, but um, but I really think that the um, that one's own personal and social relations are where one has to begin in in doing away with this with this Manichaean society in which we're living in. One of the things I would say is I don't even know if it's ideology more than it is a kind of tribal partisanship, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because I, I'm not, yeah. Communism and those ideas were built, were, 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 were political philosophies. And one of the things I've been but struck wait, Danielle, by- But wait, but what I was doing was I'm kind of trying to be generous. I'm paying the compliment to the Trump supporters of attributing beliefs to them. Right, In other words- right. right. But they're not- That's what I mean. Right, they're not, it, it, in many ways, it's kind of, even sub-political. One of, one of yeah. uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who is not a Trump supporter, but he's a conservative. Um, and he told me that both his girlfriend and his mother were huge Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. um, so he's had to navigate this very personally. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you do? What do they say to you? And he, he you know, he, he said, well, they, they, you know, they, they get mad at me and um, but they try and say, like, I like his policies. And I said, yeah, but people say that and it's not about policies. There's something more than that. And he goes, he said, yeah, I think when they talk about it, they say, how can you be with them? Right. right. What are you doing with them? Right. And I realized that um, the Trump supporters and we've had a, a, a husband come on our program and talk about how he his wife disagrees with him and what does he do? And there is that, it, they convey this sense that whatever you think of Trump is what you think of a Trump supporter. So if you think mm -hmm. Trump is horrible and cruel and all the things that one can think, they take it very personally. And I think that's different from disagreeing politically or ideologically, that everything that you might criticize Trump with seems to land on the supporter very personally. And that's but why I think it's more I'm sorry. No, anyway, that's why I think it's 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 far more emotionally charged than it than it's but been. Let's complicate it a little more, because the truth is that if you believe that some of Trump's policies have been not just wrong, but evil, say the treatment of children at the border right. or the racist remarks after Charlottesville and elsewhere or the mocking of disadvantaged. If you then it is not hard to understand why 
people who recoil from this, whether they're social justice warriors or not, uh, would 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 start making these terrible generalizations. In other words, what I'm saying is that we're recommending a kind of surgical separation of a person's politics from a person's soul or self. Mm -hmm. But we have to recognize also that sometimes in certain circumstances, that's very hard to do. That's very hard to do. And we all have cases, I think, that we can imagine where we wouldn't be willing to do it. The obvious case is a Nazi, right? I am not, I repeat, not saying that Trump is a Nazi. Uh, but there are, I feel the same about Stalinists. I might have, this were 1948 or 50 or 52, I might have a hard time breaking bread with certain people. And there's also a certain kind of integrity to that. So I'm saying this not to justify all the recreational political hatred in our country, but um, just to indicate that what we're all recommending in certain circumstances can be really, really hard to do. It's asking a lot of people. It really is. I mean, when you have, when you believe you're in the possession of absolute truth, for example, I have always lectured my liberal friends that they do not sufficiently understand that an open society and a liberal, liberal order causes pain to certain kinds of religious believers. They are much too quick to dismiss that pain because they don't sufficiently appreciate that people who believe that they have God's word or absolute truth don't understand why they shouldn't act as if they do. And in a liberal society, that's that's a complicated proposition. And so what we're demanding of people now really is is very hard. It's a great spiritual achievement to restrain one's sense of one's own truth in the name of charity and respect and social peace. Hmm. Peggy, let me bring that point to you in terms of language. Because part of our issue, and you're both wordsmiths, um, that the language, just as you were noting, the language on social media has changed and people just speak to each other in ways that we seem so disobliging. Um, so has our political rhetoric uh, changed. And one of the things, I, 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 you ever watch old Reagan video clips, he almost sounds Victorian. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's his grammar is perfect. He speaks in whole sentences and it's and it's always, you know, at his best and slash your best soaring for sort of greater unifying truths, which now um, we don't see at all. How do you explain just the complete degeneration of our political language and also is it possible, given the antipathy that people have towards each other now, would inspirational talk work with the kind of soaring truths that you were always trying to reach at in the Reagan speeches work today? I always think with, with um, speeches now, with political speeches now, um, they're, they're kind of empty and vapid, mm. kind of full of yearnings. They're kind of full of statements that nobody could could possibly argue with. Um, and those statements are not really statements of belief. They're sort of aspirational. They contain phrases like, has no place in America. Mm -hmm. Bigotry has no place in America. Right, Let's going say. forward, yes. Going forward. Um, but also, there's nothing we can't do if we set our minds together to achieve it. Do you know what I mean? That's that's not what 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 a political program is about. I find that political leaders for about the past 30 years they keep going in language that is less and less powerful for your heart. The language is less and less powerful because it's more iterative. It's more imitating of 10 years before. It has less power. Uh, and they never go for the great underused organ of the brain. What I miss in, in rhetoric and politics now is somebody who tells me, say, here is why I am a conservative. Here is how 
I see the world. Here is how I see man. Here is how it applies to the arrangements by which we govern ourselves. And here is how my beliefs apply to the great questions before us at this time. You know, one of the reasons I think everybody loves Churchill, one of the reasons you like Churchill is that he often was appealing to your brain. Everybody remembers him as, as appealing to your heart or being wonderfully <clears throat> clever or alliterative. But, but, but I miss the days when political figures made real arguments. Uh, and they were intellectually based arguments and arguments that appeal to your intellect. That's just gone by the boards. Uh, and it's bad because it leaves us all bored. We are all bored by there's nothing we can't do if we just summon the guts and the spirit to do it. Um, we've heard it for way too many decades. Uh, Reagan, by the way, he loved to explain where he stood and why he stood there. It, it was his meat. It was what he wanted to do. Um, social media, um, it's full of fragmentary language, accusation, funny jokes. At least there's a lot of humor going around on social media. I mean, if I go on once a day, I will probably laugh once a day. Uh, there's great creativity in America, antic creativity. But the air of social media is not an emotionally well air. Well, this pandemic has forced so many of us to become home cooks or cooking more than we might like. Um, difficulty of ordering in and, of course, difficulty of going out. So Green Chef is here to your rescue. Um, Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company that makes eating well, easy and affordable and with plans to fit every lifestyle. So it's a fun meal kit. And I know we're all looking for things to do in COVID. Um, and how Green Chef works is that it lets you choose from a wide array of easy to follow recipes. And it's perfect for keto, paleo and plant-based diets, or even if you just wanna eat healthier. Recipes are quick and easy with step-by-step -step instructions, chef's tips, and photos to guide you along. And everything is handpicked, featuring the organic veggies and high-quality proteins you want delivered to your door contact-free. Ingredients come pre-measured, perfectly proportioned, and mostly prepped. Um, I really love the ability to choose from a, a carb-free uh, menu. I'm on a mm, bit of a diet, especially as I anticipate coming through these holidays. And so I was really excited to be able to make things like Korean kimchi beef patties, um, or I had uh, just an amazing chicken with basil pesto, and it came with a creamy spaghetti squash noodles. So, so, whether you, so whether you're trying to avoid carbs or maybe you want carbs or Whatever diet you're on, they have a meal for you. So go to greenchef.com slash femsplain90, that's 90, and use code femsplain90 to get $90 off, including free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash femsplain90, and use code femsplain90 to get $90 off, including free shipping. Green Chef is convenient and easy, and why not let it take some of the stress out of your weekly meal planning and cooking? You know, I think you're right. Whenever somebody, whenever a politician speaks English in a beautiful or moving way, you sit up and listen because it almost never happens. Yeah. I remember I had that experience of all people during W's first inaugural address, I don't think of W exactly as Churchill, but Mike Gerson wrote a sentence that I will never forget. W said, quote, no insignificant human was ever born. Hmm. Now he may have, that may have been what we would call a dog whistle on the abortion question, but it's much bigger than that. It was a yeah. genuinely deep and beautiful sentence. And I remember it to this day. Yeah. I think there was an exception, the interesting exception in all this in terms of the language, which has been ravaged by the technology and by a lot in by, uh, the English language and politics, of course, was Obama. 
who is not a man that I admire especially, but who is a highly intelligent man. His eloquence is overrated, but yeah. you know, compared to other politicians, um, we were operating intellectually at a slightly higher level, uh, which only proves for me in many cases that you can be intellectually more sophisticated and still be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, pr the deeper problem about our politicians, but with a lot of Americans too, is I think that most of everybody now holds strong beliefs, but very few people can give you the actual reasons for their beliefs. I think that, uh, you know, and sometimes I think that an opinion is a belief without the reasons. And that if you want to turn an opinion into a belief, you have to provide the reasons. And if you ask, you're, I don't know what an average American is anymore, but if you ask many Americans and certainly many of the people on Capitol Hill, why they believe certain things, meaning if you ask them for arguments, either moral arguments or historical examples, they couldn't give them to you. They simply signed up for what a philosopher once called a package mentality. They simply signed up. They got the package. It came delivered. You know, everything goes with everything else. They have an answer to every question. There is no dissonance. It all adds up seamlessly, and it's wrapped up in a big red, white, and blue ribbon. And uh, that means that our politics have, in some ways, become even more unthinking than they used to be. I mean, you know, in a democracy, I don't mean to go on for so long, but in a democracy, we govern ourselves by tabulating our opinions. We call that an election. Um, but even with, between elections, we govern ourselves by our opinions, which means that the quality, the intellectual quality of our opinions is a very important factor in the quality of our political and social life, which means that the, the sources, the, the methods of our opinion formation are what a lot depends on. Now, when Madison and the far, far framing the framers talked about democratic deliberation, even though they couldn't have imagined them, we know they did not mean cable television and social media. We know that. We know that. Are you sure? And uh, positive. I saw George Mason the other night. Um, um, but um, and so it's very, very important that we understand what is the difference between voicing or signaling an opinion on the one hand and democratically deliberating and holding a belief on the other hand? Because as long as we're just throwing slogans at each other, this thing is never going to get better. Well, exactly. And this goes, Peggy, what you were saying is this idea of using phrases of our shared mission together don't land. And is it possible? And, and, and the, the, the parties themselves can't seem to distinguish each other very well from one or the other. Is it possible that we just don't have that shared vision anymore. And this is why it's so difficult for any figure, political figure, to be eloquent and unifying. Oh, I don't know. I think politicians now, once they get to the national level, are trying to give you a mood, not a thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They, mm -hmm. Leon mentioned, uh, mentioned that people can give you an opinion but they can't necessarily back up with back it up with their reasoning and their reasons and how it all connects and ought to yield an opinion. The funny thing is that is the job of politicians mm -hmm. to make an argument, to make it logical, to bring it to, uh, to explain this is the path we want to go down, to explain why we have to choose a path and why the path over here is better than this one. And what we're gonna do as we go down there and where it is we might arrive. Um, do you know, part of what I'm saying, I suppose, is that it is important in life and in communication and in politics to be concrete. Not everything is abstract. Not everything is airy and abstract. You know, some things are straight, direct, concrete, and have to do again with logic. It's funny that I keep saying that word, but 
that politicians get away with not doing that, which means not doing their job, and get to say a bunch of airy BS and then be called endlessly eloquent on cable for <laughs> their non efforts is sort of apparently it's irritating me. <laughs> yeah. Peggy, I wanted <laughs> yeah. to say that I think that you're right, but I wanted to add that the eloquence, meaning the intellectual and verbal level that we're recommending here, doesn't have to be addressed to the entire country. For example, I think that one of the conditions for the healing of the republic now will be the rebuilding of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I think that you cannot have a working democracy without two healthy parties with, 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 with real identities and so on. And both parties are in some ways broken. I think the Republican Party is more broken right now. Uh, I think that, um, and I'm, I would be very happy. I'm waiting for a Republican politician to address his fellow Republicans. He doesn't have to address the entire country. I'm waiting for the speech in which some Republican politician will brilliantly, rousingly, eloquently, argumentatively call for the rebuilding of the party. Uh, because the Republic, and I'm not being polemical here, I'm just saying that, you know, it was whatever one thinks of the Democrats, and I'm a liberal, so I'm especially sensitive to what's what's troublesome about, um, you know, progressivism is sort of an occupational hazard of liberalism. And um, in the way that conservatism has its occupational hazards, too. And, um, but I am, um, I think that the the first principles of the Republican Party, whether they're the first principles of conservatism or of, or, or of something else, I don't know, have to finally be enunciated because it was, after all, the Republican Party that inflicted this orange monster on this country. And, and so everybody, it, it, what I'm saying is everyone talks a lot about someone who will heal the nation. I think a lot of this healing, you know, should happen, you know, there's a famous, I'm going to stop here, there's a famous medieval biblical commentator in Hebrew who once said, the poor of your town and the poor of another town, the poor of your town come first. And so the important thing is that everybody find an intellectual and verbal way to deal with the failures and the depredations in their town, as it were and build from there. I mean, I long ago gave up on the idea of a president who will say something magical and we will be fine. It probably has to come from the ground up. It does. Uh, 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 two things, I think. I don't disagree with you, but I would add two things. One is that the most recent election, November 3rd, showed us something amazing and that is on the state level, mm -hmm. Republican Party is in kind of good mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. It's in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It's not in such good shape. Um, another thing, um, I, I, when you say you want to see some Republican in Washington, I think you said a senator um, speak speak great truths now. What I mean is that I would like John McCain to rise from the dead, but <laughs> that's not one of my religious beliefs, so. Well, you know, it's funny, because I was going to add to your point and say I've started reading about Margaret Chase Smith. I've mm -hmm. just got her in my head. Oh. And she was a woman who spoke great truths. She's not as remembered in history as much as she should be. Mm. Tell us. She's a very brave and hardy person, the only woman in the US Senate when she was there, and she was there for a long time. Mm -hmm. She was a moderate liberal Republican, mm -hmm. with certain conservative impulses. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's greatly beloved by Susan Collins, but and she's well remembered in Maine. What, what, what era was this, Peggy? I'm sorry, I don't well, this know. This was the 1950s, 50s. 60s, okay. and yeah. 70s. Uh, she left in the 70s. I've just begun studying her. Yep. Um, but she was 
brave and rigorous. And when she had to come forward and tell off Joe McCarthy, mm -hmm. Eve, she was the first US senator to do it. Mm -hmm. She was pretty direct and pretty tough. You should write about her, Peggy. That's why I'm reading about mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. She's just entered my mind as something mm -hmm. I have to know more about because I just had a sense that, that there is something there. Anyway, um, so that's one thing. Second thing is, look, Leon, um, in the past 50 years, the meaning of what it is to be a conservative and what conservatism is um, has changed. Mm -hmm. I saw my party stick for too long, too much with the conservatism of the 1980s, with the great avatar, Ronald Reagan. But the 1980s are not the 2010s. That's for sure. The 1980s are not 2015. Uh, so what conservatism is, what direction it will go in, is of great interest, at least intellectually. I don't happen to think voters walk into voting booths saying, mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm going to stand. I've read Yuval Levine, Yuval Levine or, or I have read J.D. Vance. Uh, I don't really think that motivates voters, but in a funny way, the thoughts of very bright people become part of what people start thinking about uh, and move, can move them forward a bit. So I think the intellectuals of the Republican Party, such as they are, uh, and some of them are very fabulous people, they are, they are, they've been starting to talk about this for the past few years, Ross Douthit mm -hmm. and Panuru and such, the, the Republican senators and House members are less philosophically inclined. Of course, yeah. Or later, one of them is going to say something interesting. What are the odds that won't happen, at least if by accident? With businesses moving many of their operations off-site and having to make tough decisions about their employees, why not consider using Bambi for your HR and save money? Because when running a business, HR issues can kill you. Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and HR manager salaries aren't cheap, an average of $70,000 a year. Bambi, spelled B-A-M-B-E-E, -E, was created specifically for small business. You can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, and maintain your compliance all for just $99 a month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. From onboarding to terminations, they customize your policy to fit your business and help you manage your employees day to day, all for $99 a month. Month to month, no hidden fees, you can cancel at any time. You didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR compliance. Let Bambi help and get your free HR audit today. So go to Bambi.com slash FEM right now to schedule your free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash FEM, spelled B-A-M to the B-E-E dot com slash FEM. Well, I agree with you, Peggy. I think that, I mean, that's one of the reasons I started this journal is I think of it as an experiment in climate change intellectually. I mean, you really want to create a weather an intellectual weather that will eventually uh, trickle up, trickle down, trickle to the side, whichever way the trickle is, uh, and influence the people who hold the levers of power. Uh, so yes, I think that's right. I will say that you know, in my almost 40 years here in Washington, and as you know, I have lots of conservative friends, uh, it has struck me that conservatives spend way too much time talking about what conservatism is or isn't. And that, that after a while, there is a kind of constant identity crisis. This is true of liberalism too, by the way. And I sometimes think that instead of trying to get the party line right 
as it were, and to have, you know, and to make it a war between banana conservatism and strawberry conservatism and apple conservatism and orange conservatism, the better thing would be just to think about relations between pe human beings and social problems and political problems. And, and there's just, there is a kind of, um, theological quality that some of these discussions take on yeah. and people get you know you live yeah in the thick i of agree this. you live Please, in the thick of this yeah uh, conservatives it seems to me to a really unusual degree think about themselves as conservatives mm -hmm. think about you know what is conservatism and mm -hmm. the, it it's becomes a very uh, it becomes an identity comes in mm -hmm. part existential. It is self-conscious. My impression is that liberals, except for a small group of liberals, most liberals are a little bit easier about the definition of liberalism um, and about liberalism as a self-identification, perhaps less self-consciously. Liberal, tell me what I'm I think a couple of things about that. I think unlike conservatism, starting with Clinton, the word liberalism and liberal became uh, forbidden in politicians' discourses because their pollsters kept telling them that when they uttered it, the no their numbers went down. So, for example, there are certain things that should be defended easily and effortlessly that liberals have been afraid to do in the last 30 years, the, the most prominent one of which is government. I think it is very easy to make a defense of government. I think that the hatred of government, as we've seen during this pandemic, in which the request to wear masks is considered as treading on somebody's liberty, um, is very deep, dangerously deep in our society. And it is the sacred duty of people who believe in government, meaning liberals and some conservatives, to just defend government. But liberals have shirked that task for political reasons. Secondly, I think that liberalism now finds itself in more of a kind of internecine war than conservatives do in the following sense. Conservatives, what they have to fight in their house, I'm taking the house as a very broad metaphor, let's just call it is Trumpism or Zen. That is easier that is pretty easy to fight on moral grounds historical grounds that yeah, the fight has to be made i mean sometimes you have to expend great efforts to refute the fact to refute the idea that two plus two equals five if millions of people believe that two plus two equals five on the liberal side however the distinction between liberalism and progressivism has been completely fudged completely fudged so that Right now, there are a lot of people to the left of the right, let's call them that, who think that liberals are just progressives who don't have the guts to say so. And there are liberals wandering around thinking that people like Ocasio-Cortez, that's what they really mean, but don't have the guts to say it. And they have completely forgotten that liberalism and progressivism are two entirely separate worldviews entirely separate on fundamental questions on capitalism on america's place in the world and american intervention on the grounds of civil rights and civil liberties fundamentally different worldviews now we all voted for biden but you will agree that voting for a president is intellectually the coarsest act one can commit because basically one just has to choose between the two names on the ballot um, that's not how one expresses oneself fully philosophically. Uh, but right now, there is a real, a very interesting and necessary debate that has to happen in which liberals reassert the difference between liberalism and progressivism. I know I'm beginning to sound a little theological. No, I but agree in fact, with you. But they got to win that back. It well, is, you know, the, the, Trump was good for progressives. Um, in the way that George W. Bush increased the subscription of the Nation magazine by I don't know how many issues. I mean, you know, the left and the right historically can always live with each other. It's the liberals they must all kill. <laughs> They're the ones who must die. Well, well and, let, me, let me take it back to a more general um, view and actually using some of your words from your essay, um, uh, Leon, in your 
in your new magazine. In my fine new journal, yes. Your yes. fine new journal, yes, thank Liberties. You, thank you, Danielle. Yes. Um, <laughs> one of the issues, it seems, and this, I think, was a strong reason for support of Trump, is um, you wrote about the dangers of what you called of focusing on the other versus our mutual sameness. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to mm -hmm. quote what you said. You said, if it is impossible for people of different backgrounds or classes or races or genders to understand each other, why are they disappointed or angry when they are not understood? Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost like we have this huge national misunderstanding, as you say, whether it's between liberals, progressives and the right, it's between men and women. So as we get to the end of this discussion, how do we start trying to overcome this? And I we know that's cannot, a big we, question. And you, as, as Peggy said at the beginning, and you said, well, we have to look past our politics, but maybe politics are more ingrained than we think. Um, actually, yeah. Leon, you've been to the land of the canceled and back. I have. And you had to express a lot of um, remorse. Uh, I but did. You were also put in a position where people were excessively cruel and unkind. And thank you. They were as as we know, you never like to find out who your friends are. And you had to go through that. So you've had to come through a kind of forgiveness with others as much as you have sought forgiveness. How have you done that? What advice well, do you give? Um, I guess two things, just briefly about my experience, because I don't want this or anything else to be ever just about my experience. One of the things that I most ardently believe, and we'll get to that, that's the second point, is that one cannot understand the entire world from the standpoint of one's own experience. That's a cardinal principle for me. Uh, and we are living in a society in which people are taught the opposite. That if you're a woman or if you're gay or if you're black or if you're Jewish or if you're Southern or if, that that's all you need to know, mm -hmm. that that suffices for an understanding of the world. And the world is always much bigger than every one of us, than every one of us. Uh, you read my essay, you'll know that I wrote about my failure to understand the way in which people who were unlike me, specifically certain women, though I'm not going to relitigate a damn thing, um, perceived me, um, that I allowed my, my standpoint, my vantage point to tyrannize the way I saw other people. And that was a that was a that was a failing. That was a mistake. And but it's a it's it, but this is a point that is generalizable or as they like to say today, scalable. Um, my own experience was uh, I asked for forgiveness of there were there were well, I'm not going to go into details because I resolved not to, um, but I did ask for forgiveness. And I did have friends who stood by me spectacularly. I mean, one of the most, it was some of the most enriching and morally and emotionally illuminating experiences of my life. I gained from the steadfastness of people who were really extraordinary with certain, unfortunately, very painful and notable exceptions. Um, and I resolved at the beginning to apologize, to go away, to think my thoughts, to be with my son, to, um, and for someone like myself who led this charmed life and who had been in the white hot center of things for a long time, for decades, it was one of, it was, not only an unexpected experience, it was in many ways a profoundly illuminating experience. Uh, not that I wish, you know, if I had, I mean, I, not that I would, I'm glad that it happened, but I learned many, many things. I think that the answer to your question more generally is that we must agree finally that nobody is just the sum of their circumstances 
That is to say, nobody is just their inherited identities. Nobody is just their gender or their skin color. Nobody is, well, as Brian Stevenson famously likes to say, is just the worst thing they've ever done. That everybody is more than this culture expects them to be. Because right now, this culture expects everyone to be a happy and usually angry representative of some group, of some generalization. And you can pick. And intersectionality is just the idea that they can be representatives of many groups at a time. Uh, but people are more than their origins. People are not plants. They are not just roots. People in their souls and in their minds and in their hearts travel very far. And if they don't use their imaginations to try to understand other people, then they are going to stay trapped in their experience. The sentence that you quoted in my essay, there has been this cult, as you all know, of the other now for 25 years. We always hear about otherness, certainly among philosophers, but even you know, the homeless man on the street is the other and I must feel for the other. The important thing to realize is that A, first that he is the other, that my experience of my life will not suffice for me to understand what he is experiencing. Uh, but the reason that I must make the additional effort to understand it is because he's not only the other, he's also the same. He's also the same. We are both human beings. So that one has to finally believe that white people can understand black people and black people can understand white people and men can understand women and women can understand men if they each agree to make the effort to do so. If they agree that there is a common denominator that we all share, because if there isn't, if there isn't, then we're lost, then we're lost. We're just a nation of nations and a bubble of bubbles and, uh, you know, a, 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 just a bunch of echo chambers, just, a, you know, a society of echo chambers. And we know that that's not the case, because, in fact, in practical affairs, we understand each other across our differences all the time, all the time. And not just between Americans. We understand Chinese people and Russian people and Arab people and Latin American people. We have to translate and we have to correct for different misunderstandings and so on. But unless we get past the idea that we are the sum total of our, our circumstances, we're doomed. Here endeth the lesson. <laughs> yes. Um, Leon just made me think of two things that I read when young. The, fir the first is, I think Leon is talking in part, or just was talking now, in part about the richness of the human soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And C.S. Lewis said the greatest thing, which I, I read many years ago, which is that civilizations come and go, societies rise and fall. But the waiter who poured your coffee at breakfast this morning, he is eternal because mm -hmm. his soul is eternal. Mm -hmm. That's one. The other is when you talk about vantage point, Leon, I have no idea why I think of this so often, but I do. It's something I read in a book when I was high, in high school. A librarian gave it to me and turned to a page and said, look at that. And what I saw was, it was the memoir of a Nobel Prize winner. I have no idea who it was, a winner in chemistry or something like that. Uh, but he said, the part she pointed out to me said, you think pepper is gray, but everything depends on your vantage point. You think pepper is gray, but an ant thinks pepper, as in salt and pepper, is black and white. 
Mm -hmm. That struck me so hard when I was a kid. And but Peggy, let's let's put just a little pressure on that too, because what we are not saying, and we I agree with you completely, we are not saying that everything is relative. We are saying that everything, everybody must make the effort to try to arrive at corrections of their limitations. Yes. In other words, sometimes sure. the vantage point argument is used exactly in the way that I don't want it to be used. I see. I see, you see what point. I'm saying. Yes, and I do. So it's we, we even if perfect objectivity is impossible, perfect subjectivity is a nightmare. Yeah. It's a nightmare. <laughs> and yeah. so we need to get out and try to correct by meeting each other is what I mean to say. Got it. Understood. Okay, good. Um, well, Peggy, you um, in one of your recent columns, you quoted Edmund Burke, and then after you said, only from the warmth of heart, not with it alone, but it must be there, can you build what will last? So in some sense, you're saying the same things, that having that openness inside, that willingness to hear the other, um, to get by what has been in the past, um, is, is, is hard, but I guess there, we have no other choice. <laughs> you know, I think at the end of the day, everybody is trying to go through life pretty much, all the adults going through life, just kind of trying to keep their own morale up. Keep that in mind as you deal with the other humans. Everybody's just mm -hmm. keep their own morale up, make it through another day. Well, thank you both of you so much for joining for the Thanksgiving special. I wish you a beautiful holiday. Um, and uh, of course, all our listeners as well. Uh, for those of you who are not subscribers, you're going to be missing out on our monthly last call episode where our listeners, our subscribers get to ask our guests questions. So Peggy and Leon are going to hang around for a minute to answer one. Thank you both. Have a lovely holiday. Everybody have a lovely holiday. And you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. Good to see you, Leon. And you, Peggy. The Femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the Ricochet Network and available pretty much on every podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers and get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum.